Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's presentation with Dr. Wendy Bameter, presented by the Sash Bear Foundation. Um, this presentation is part of our expert education series of presentations by experts in the field of emotion dysregulation, dialectical behaviors therapy, BPD, and related topics. Um, we are a charity. The Sash Bear Foundation operates in Canada. Uh, we are a registered charity here. And we do all of our work uh, on a charitable basis. Most of our work is offered through volunteers and um, most of our funding comes from donations. So we welcome you to make a donation and support our work if you find the things that we provide to you are helpful. We're so glad that you could be with us this evening. Um, so this evening's presentation will be with Dr. Wendy Bameter. She was here with us in November. And at that time, she presented for us on how to support sexual minority youth that recording is available on our YouTube channel, so I encourage you to check it out if you were not able to attend that particular presentation. Tonight, she's back with us again, and uh, we'll be presenting on how to support transgender and non-binary youth. So um, just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. I want to let you know that this is being recorded. However, you are all hidden and your cameras and microphones are automatically turned off. You can submit some questions. You can use either the chat or the Q&A function to submit your questions. We will try to answer some of those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, however, I do need to warn you that we can't address any specific issues that are particular to a, a certain family or a particular uh, situation. So we'll try to generalize the questions and answer those that are of the most general impact for uh, family members uh, attending and also the topics that are most closely related to the subject matter that Dr. Bameter has presented tonight. And uh, you can also find the recording in a couple of weeks on our YouTube channel. And also the slides will be available. She has graciously agreed to provide the slides for anyone who would like to request those at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you watch the chat, you will see some links, uh, places where you can find our previously recorded presentations, places where you can make donations, and email addresses where you can contact us to find more. So let me please now introduce, I'm so, I'm so excited to have her back with us, Dr. Bameter. Wendy Bameter is PhD, uses pronouns she, her, hers. She is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in dialectical behavior therapy for adolescents and for young adults. And she is the program director at McLean Hospital's Three East Cambridge Residence. In addition to working with individuals struggling with pervasive emotion dysregulation and high-risk behaviors, Dr. Bameter is also committed to providing affirming care to LGBTQIA individuals and their families. She also has extensive training in delivering culturally sensitive individual and family therapy in Spanish. Her research and teaching background focuses on improving mental health interventions for underserved communities, including monolingual Spanish-speaking immigrants, transgender and non-binary individuals, and African Americans in community mental health settings. As a therapist, she likes to balance mindfulness, warmth, and humor with change-oriented interventions. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so happy to have you with us. Please take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Doreen and uh, Kathleen and Barb and Lynn, uh, the whole Sash Bear Foundation. Um, I'm so excited to be back. You are all doing such incredible work and I had so much fun last time. Um, so I'm happy to be back. Uh, and to all the viewers, thanks so much for, for showing up to sort of take this time to learn this important topic or learn to learn more about this important topic. Really happy to have you here. So let me go ahead and pull up my slides. Okay. There we go. All right. So there we go. Okay. So the first piece I want to say um, is that you know I'm here tonight talking to you about trans and non-binary youth, and I'm coming at it from a clinical perspective, a research perspective. And I think it's really important for me to acknowledge that sort of, I identify as cisgender, which means my gender identity is in line with the sex I was assigned at birth. And so none of what I share tonight 
comes from lived experience. And I, and I think that part's really, really important to own and to make clear. And so I'm so thrilled that you're here and I hope I have something to offer. And at the same time, I think it's incredibly important to sort of reach out and learn from people about their lived experiences. And so I've just included here a number of folks who I really admire, who do incredible work um, just in terms, and, and they all have social media sort of uh, profiles. Particularly, I think one of my favorites up here is Skylar Bailar, um, top left. Um, Skylar is an incredible um, advocate for our trans and non-binary youth and does a ton of education um, across the states and, and I imagine internationally too. And so I would really encourage people to, to check out uh, the work of a lot of these folks on the screen and so many others. Um, so tonight we will do a number of things. I, this is sort of a follow-up to the last talk I gave, which was on supporting sexual minority youth. And you'll see some similar, you know, I'll bring up some similar ideas. I'm a DBT therapist, so I'll continue to speak DBT, um, integrating that as we go. Some of the slides, there will certainly be overlap from what we did last time. Um, and, and of course, the focus tonight, instead of focusing on um, sexual minor, minority youth, is really to look at sort of the gender and sex piece. And so we're going to be looking at um, ways to support, to learn about and to support trans and non-binary youth. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll do some sort of basic psychoeducation. We'll talk about mental health specifically, and then dive into ways to be supported. Supportive. Um, and we can sort of be supportive at individual levels and then larger systemic levels. And we'll talk about both. And I'll connect you with resources and then we'll, we'll get to the questions. And uh, just like last time, again, because I'm a DBT therapist, we'll integrate some DBT along the way. So starting with some DBT, we talked about this last time, but if in case anybody wasn't here, I actually think this is really, really important. When we're talking about challenging topics like this, this topic can be challenging for so many reasons. Um, it can be challenging because it might be something that you feel like you just don't understand. You can't wrap your brain around. And so that might lead you to feel judgmental. It might lead you to feel scared. And when we get judgmental, we're not able to think as critically. And so some of the skills and agreements I hope we can hold tonight can help us sort of absorb as much as possible from this talk um, and keep our emotions in check. Um, so one is, is this concept of non-judgment. What I really invite everybody to do tonight is to practice non-judgment of the material of perhaps the trans and non-binary loved ones you have in your lives. And very importantly of yourselves, non-judgment of yourself. I will say, don't use this word or don't do this. If you've done it, that's okay. Um, please, please, please don't judge yourself. Um, we're all learning. I make mistakes all the time. I think the important thing is when we make a mistake, we acknowledge it and we learn from it and we move on. So this is a judgment-free zone. Um, similarly, as I'm talking about mistakes, I think one of the, the agreements in DBT that I love so much is we refer to as the fallibility agreement. And with that, we all acknowledge that we're fallible. We don't know everything. We make mistakes. And instead of getting defensive and trying to back up our positions, we agree that this is just sort of part of being human. And that makes more room for us to sort of acknowledge when we've done something unhelpful or ineffective, and it allows us to continue learning and to move forward. So I hope you can all hold that tonight too. Um, what else? The other piece that, that I think is helpful that we pull a lot from DBT is the concept of remembering that we're doing the best we can and we've always done the best we could at any given moment, given the skills we had on board, given the vulnerabilities we had on board, um, given the knowledge we had at that time, we've always been doing the best we can. And the other side of that, the, the other side of the dialectic is we have to do better and we wanna to continue to do better. And so I think that's really important as you go through tonight and maybe you come across something you're like, wow, I didn't do that quote unquote, right? And, and that's where we can be gentle with ourselves and remember we're doing the best we can and there's always room for improvement. All right. So first we'll get into sort of the sex and gender 101. Um, some of this information I'll just acknowledge might be really, really familiar and sort of basic for some of you and for others, it can be really complicated. So again, um, please be patient with yourselves. So to start out sort of the way beginning, 
it's important for us all to sort of be on the same page around understanding, remembering that sex and gender are different ideas, they're different constructs, and they often get lumped together. Sex and gender often get lumped together with sexuality too. So we want to make sure that we are just sort of parsing everything apart. Um, that's really important sort of as we go forward in this talk. So when we're talking about sex, we're talking about biology, we're talking about organic markers of um, that, that reflect somebody's sex. And I think a lot of us, when we think about sex, we think about genitalia and that's sort of it, right? Or maybe chromosomes. And, um, you know, doctors across time have highlighted that and helped us see that actually there's, there's a whole bunch of different organic markers that can tell us, um, that can give us important information about sex. So that includes hormones, genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, a whole bunch of different genes. And so with this information, we can understand and trying to hold the idea that even sex is not as binary as we're sometimes led to believe. So you could even tonight try to consider to imagine even sex sort of in existing more in a continuum than you might have otherwise um, thought about. So for example, thinking about sex as existing more in a continuum would be much more inclusive of individuals who are intersex, right? So individuals who are intersex um, have different sex markers that might not fit into this perfect category of female or male, right? Um, and there's many different ways to be intersex. And, and we want to be inclusive of intersex folks too. I think the, the sort of prevalence rate is 1.7% of the population, which I think is the same as redheads, right? But we know so little about intersex people and we don't often talk about intersex people and they're there um, and we want to make space for them. And so that, that is the sex piece that, that I hope um, we can sort of keep in mind that it's more on a continuum than, than we even recognize. And then separately, we've got gender, sex and gender. Gender really is a social construct. Um, it is a concept that we sort of, as humans sort of came up with language to help us um, explain how we felt about sort of our relationship to sex and this idea of gender specifically, when we're talking about this social construct, we can break it down into a number of different factors. So primarily what we'll be talking about is people's gender identity. And that's something um, that has to do with our self-concept. So it's my inner sense of seeing myself as a woman, as a man, as both, as neither, as somewhere in between. Um, one of the things that cisgender people often don't have to ask themselves is like, when did you first know that you were a cisgender, right? Or how do you know you're cisgender? And that's something that trans and non-binary people get asked all the time, right? And in all cases, we're talking about really gender identity. Um, and so I think that's important when we're thinking about privilege, right? Is um, just like, you know, we're talking about race, we talk about folks who are white, for example, who have white privilege, we're thinking about gender it's important and helpful sometimes to think about uh, cisgender privilege. So that's the gender identity piece. And then we've got separately gender roles and gender expression. So gender roles has to do with what we would traditionally say. I might say, oh, that's very sort of traditionally uh, feminine, right? So like a girl playing with a doll, right? That might be really traditionally feminine activity. Um, and what we're looking at here is this is what society has denoted as a typical activity or behavior according to gender. So for example, somebody who dresses in all pink, we might think, oh yeah, like if it's a, if, if it's a you know, young girl who's dressing in all pink, we might say, yeah, she's really ascribing to sort of stereotypical gender roles. Um, but what's interesting about that is like pink in the past wasn't actually a color associated with girls much at all. It was associated with boys. And so you can see sort of how interesting it is to think about social constructs and across time and what, what we denote as feminine or masculine or neutral. Um, it's all kind of made up. Um, so that's, that's, I think, important to keep in our minds. And then gender expression, this is how we express our gender identity to the world. And that can change a lot across time and space. Um, so that might be the way we move our bodies. That might be, excuse me, the clothes we wear. That might be um, sort of the, the way we speak. Different kinds of gender expression um, are, we, we sort of engage in different kinds of gender expression across time, sometimes depending on how safe we feel. 
Um, and that's particularly true for, for trans and non-binary people. So just to really, really be clear, your people, somebody's gender expression doesn't have to line up with gender identity. And I think sometimes we often think that they should. Um, so that's important to remember. So I hope that's helpful, just thinking about the differences between gender, sex, and sort of gender roles and expression. And I wanna talk for a moment about gender development. Um, we know from a good amount of research at this point that around two to three children begin to understand the concept of gender. So I have a two and a half year old daughter and she's like sort of really playing with pronouns right now, just he and she pronouns, just trying to understand them. And um, you can sort of see the wheels turning and generally she gets people's pronouns right. Um, so she's starting to understand this concept of gender. And then we see around three to four, most children at this point have a stable gender identity. It doesn't mean that they always deeply know their gender identity across time. For example, some trans folks realize that they're trans, you know, at 15, but there's a reason for that. Um, but the stable sense of gender identity that's sort of innate, right, really de develops oftentimes between three to four years old. And just to, to sort of the point I was just making before, we know from a good amount of research too that there's a significant time gap between when somebody starts to have questions about gender identity, when they start to put words to, you know, I think actually I don't fit in the box that I thought I fit in. There's a big time gap between that moment and when they actually communicate it to somebody else. And I think this part's really important because I really feel for a lot of parents who sort of saw their kids develop across time and looked like they were engaging in all of these quote unquote, like traditional gender roles, right? Um, and then all of a sudden at 15, your kid comes to you and says, I, I'm trans or I think I'm trans. That could be a massive shock. That can be really, really surprising. And based on what we know from people's sort of self-reports and the qualitative research we've done and quantitative research, it's actually really common for there to be a pretty sizable gap. And so, one, some of the reasons for that are that one, um, there's a lot of stigma around not fitting in that box, right? Around talking about that fact that actually you're not, you're not really sure you're cisgender, right? You actually might be a boy, you might be a girl, you, you don't feel like either. There's a lot of stigma that comes from that that people would understandably want to avoid. Another huge piece is a lack of knowledge and information. Um, so before I was at McLean, I was at a gender clinic in, um, in New Haven, and we had folks come in and we would do assessments to sort of help assess with them, with all of the um, patients, sort of where they were at in their gender journeys and try to figure out what kind of supports they needed, what questions do they need answered. Um, and some of the stories people would say, um, they would be sort of reading books when they were younger. And I remember this one person who said, um, you know, I, I remember feeling like this aha moment when I learned there was going to be no, like I'd have no gender in heaven. And, and that person, you know, children this age, they don't have access to all of the language that we adults have access to, but that was sort of their initial sort of realization of like, ah, something's different. Right. And then what I would often hear, and I still hear this all the time today is as people access information, see shows on TV where they see trans folks, hear about trans people in the news, go to pride parades, they're all of a sudden equipped with the words that they didn't have. So I wanna be really clear, it's not that the TV shows or pride parades are making people queer, are making people trans or non-binary, it's that they're giving information, they're giving words to people to, um, to try on to see if they fit better with their experience. And uh, the stigma piece is really similar to the rejection, discrimination. So when we're thinking about uh, gender, before I was talking about sex, even sex, like thinking about it as more on the continuum, you're probably all more familiar with thinking about or hearing people talk about sort of moving beyond the gender binary. And if you haven't heard about that, that's fine too. Um, so when we're thinking about gender, oftentimes a lot of us were raised, you know, you're either a boy or a girl. That's sort of what we were taught. Um, and in this wonderful handbook created by the Trevor Project, they've got these graphics that I love that I sometimes use to help people understand gender identity a little better. And so this is a really binary construct of gender, right? That you're either a boy or a girl and you have to fit in one of these boxes. 
And then we can expand that. We can say, actually, no, it's not that binary. There's a continuum or there's a spectrum. We often talk about a spectrum. And for some folks, that's really helpful to think about that spectrum. For others, it actually still feels limiting. And so the Trevor Project in this handbook, I, I sometimes refer to this as just like an amorphous like blob or an amoeba. And it's actually way more helpful for a lot of people to um, map themselves out on this and not see it, not see gender as so linear, but actually like there's infinite possibilities. Um, so for example, you'll see, you know, if you mark yourself right here, you might be a cisgender woman, you might be a cisgender, a cisgender woman, or you might be a trans woman, right? But you really identify as like highly in a binary way. Whereas maybe you feel pretty feminine and at the same time, not completely. And actually you're closer to a non-binary identity. And I know this might just like hurt some people's heads because it takes time to sort of wrap your, your brain around all of this, but some people might identify as sort of put themselves on the map sort of as right here and here at the same time, right? Um, so there are many, many different ways to think about gender identity to identify. Um, and I think it's incredibly helpful to think about gender as a journey that we're all on. We're all trying to explore our gender identity across time. Some of us do it more consciously than others. Um, and just because you identify sort of one place right now doesn't mean you have to or will you know, a week later or two weeks later or two years later, we're on a journey. And I think it's helpful to practice sort of non-attachment to the outcome and instead really just be in the process um, and create space to explore. And so when we're thinking about gender identities, we've got a whole bunch of different terms. Really, there could be, because it's a, the gender itself is a social construct, there could be infinite terms to describe gender identity. Um, I'll go through a few. Um, so you've heard me use the language cisgender. I imagine most of you at this point have heard this term, but cisgender, so cis is the same in Latin. And so cisgender is um, somebody who identifies as, whose gender identity lines up with the same, the same sex they were assigned at birth. Um, when somebody is transgender, it's sort of the opposite of that. So um, somebody who's transgender, they find that their um, their gender identity does not line up with the sex they were assigned at birth. And so I wanna sort of talk a little bit about different terminology that we want to potentially use or stay away from. And you know, whatever I say tonight, across time, this could evolve. And so I think it's really important for us to continue to engage with this material and to keep learning. But one thing I can say for certain is, is we want to just we want to describe somebody as like some this person is transgender as an adjective, not use it as a verb. So it's transgendered. It makes it sound like something happened to them or they were transgendered versus like, hey, you were born this way. And then some people will use the term trans transgenderism. And I think that, that sounds um, too much like some kind of condition. And we know that it's not. Um, there's no there's no pathologizing happening when we're talking about trans identities. And so we'll use it as an adjective. When we refer to somebody as a transgender man, this is somebody who, um, who currently in their identity really identifies with being a man, whatever that means to them. And you know, everybody has different versions of what that means. Um, and this person might've been assigned female at birth. So AFAB is assigned female at birth. That means when, the, when you were born, the doctors said like, congratulations, you've got a girl. Um, so assigned female at birth, um, this person, we could also call somebody who's trans masculine or who's a transgender man, somebody who's trans masculine. Um, the FTM is in parentheses, that's much less preferred FTM. So it's female to male, but in some ways, somebody who's trans, who's a trans man might say, well, I never identified as female. That doesn't really work for me, but just want you to know sort of that you might see that written somewhere, but that's sort of falling out of favor. Um, and then we've got a ton of different non-binary identities and really non-binary identity is, is really big umbrella term to encompass people who don't subscribe to the gender binary. So, um, that might be somebody who identifies, for example, as two spirit. So two spirit identities go way, way, way back. Um, they were, um, initially sort of named, um, or sort of the term came from indigenous communities, first nation communities, 
um, to reflect people who, again, didn't ascribe to this colonial version of a binary gender identity. It might be a third gender. It might be um, sort of a little mix of both. It could be neither. Um, and so that, that is one identity that I think is really important to know about. And then here's a bunch of other terms. I won't go through every single one of them. Um, one that I'll highlight is gender fluid. This one I think is an, an, um, a term that oftentimes people use perhaps incorrectly. Um, and again, whatever somebody uses, you wanna ask them sort of what language do you use and what does it mean to you? Um, so gender fluid, typically my understanding of gender fluid is that it often reflects an identity that where somebody's sense of their identity, gender identity is fluid across time and space. And so for some people it's like, I'm feeling more feminine today, or I'm feeling more masculine today. It really is fluid versus this sort of stable, fixed sense of identity. Um, the other piece that's really important is it's completely fine not to label your gender identity. And I work with a lot of youth who um, are at a point where they're saying it's, it's actually not helpful. It feels constrictive. Um, and they prefer not to use the label. And I think that's really important to respect across time that people um, may on their journeys of sort of exploring their gender choose not to use an, an, uh, a label and we, and we don't need to push, push that. So here's one, one resource that can be helpful for us to sort of figure out um, how to distinguish between everything I've been talking about. Um, so this is the gender unicorn. And here we've got uh, gender identity, separate from gender expression, separate from sex assigned at birth. And then down here, we've got sexual orientation. And as I talked about, I think I talked about this in November, when we're thinking about sexual orientation, it can actually be helpful to even distinguish between physical attraction and emotional attraction, because they can be very different for people. Um, so let's have some fun for a second. Okay. Just to sort of get us thinking about this, we can sort of, we can all sort of fill out this form and rate where we feel like we fall, right? And so just to think about our understanding of identities so far, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to see your answer, but maybe somebody can tell me. Um, if we're looking at gender identity, let's look at sex assigned at birth. So this person was assigned male at birth. So when the person was born, the doctor said, congratulations, you've got a boy. And this person identifies very in a very sort of very much uh, in a feminine way, right? So they said, yes, 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 all the way over here for feminine. They don't identify with a masculine identi gender identity at all. They don't identify with an other gender identity at all in terms of gender expression, sort of how they live that expression, how they live that gender identity in the world. Um, very feminine, tiny, tiny bit masculine and, and nothing else. So based on this, I'm trying to see if I'm going to be, yes, I'll be able to see the chats. Can somebody write what you imagine this person might identify as? And I say imagine because we can't know. Somebody has to tell us how they identify. But can you think about terminology that this person might use in terms of gender identity? Yeah, exactly. A transgender woman. Oh, you guys are getting ahead. You're going to the sexual orientation. Okay, yes. So this person might identify as trans femme, as Valerie said. Um, this person might identify as trans woman. This person would probably, and again, you'd have to ask her, um, but would probably identify as like pr falling pretty much in a binary identity. It doesn't look like um, sort of a non-binary identity is really applicable, um, although the case could be made. And then yes, this person looks to be attracted to women, and so this person might identify as uh, as a lesbian as well. Okay, awesome. Just for the sake of time, um, I, we won't do this one altogether, but um, here, or I won't ask for the answers, but here we're seeing somebody where there's more variation across each of these spectrums. And um, this person, again, assigned male at birth, but I'm guessing this person might use um, some kind of gender identity, some kind of label to reflect a non-binary identity. And I'm guessing sexual orientation, like this person might identify as pansexual, as queer, maybe as bisexual. Remember we talked about last time, bisexual doesn't mean um, exclusively attracted to, to two sexes or two genders. It, it can be inclusive of um, other genders as well. All right. So if you haven't sort of 
experimented with this, it can be fun to sort of take some time to look at it. Um, many of you have probably heard of the term taking an affirmative stance, or um, even in my introductions, sort of I'm committed to doing affirming work with trans and non-binary folks. This is a term that we use in the mental health world um, and, and really in, the, in sort of the world as we're working with trans and non-binary folks to um, sort of denote that we are agreeing to a number of principles or to a num number of ideas. The American Psychological Association and a number of other associations really, really advocate for taking an affirmative approach to working with um, trans and non-binary folks. So what does that mean? It means that we all agree, just like in DBT, we have a number of agreements. It means here that we agree to other agreements. One, that gender variance is not a disorder. Um, of course, just like um, same-sex attraction, at one time, this was pathologized in the past, right? And so psychologists have contributed to this harm. Physicians have contributed to this harm. And so we are trying to sort of correct that and really acknowledge that gender diversity is not pathological. Gender presentations are highly, highly diverse. When we're thinking about gender, we imagine it to be a sort of a construct or a sort of combination between biology, development, socialization, and culture. At the end of the day, it's probably really unhelpful to try to get stuck on like, how did this person become trans? Um, it's The answer is probably very complicated and we don't know. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is what we do about it and how do we support people and affirm people and help them live their best lives. And that we understand that that's a normal, healthy part um, of their identity. Um, we acknowledge that gender is fluid and not binary. Um, somebody might take a specific binary, sort of I identify as a cis woman, um, pretty binary, um, but I agree that I don't sort of see all gender as binary. And then importantly, we agree based on the research, this is not just because we're trying to be nice people, but we understand from the research that mental health concerns, huge, huge mental health disparities that we see in trans and non-binary folks, they stem from negative cultural re reactions and they're not within the client. So there is nothing, I've said this already, but I have to keep saying it, there's nothing disordered about being trans or non-binary or gender diverse. Um, when you see disparities in mental health, a lot of it has to do with what it's like to live in this world as somebody who um, doesn't sort of fit in this box um, of, of sort of cis woman or, or male. The other piece is when we're thinking about doing an affirmative work, we're really trying to focus our attention on building resilience, building coping strategies and wellness, and not just focusing on disparities and how hard everything is. Of course, we pay attention to that, but we really want to take a strength-based approach as well and celebrate somebody's identity. Um, I get a lot of questions across time around sort of the increase in numbers in trans folks and sort of, is this a phenomena that's going on? Um, is it, you know, some people will unfortunately use the word contagious, which of course we all have problems with. Um, there's, there's, a lot of thinking that's been done about this. Um, and it's a fair question, sort of like, why why more trans people? Um, and, and here's a number of sort of factors that we'll often point to. So one is there's a long history, a very long history of discrimination and violence perpetrated towards trans and non-binary folks, as well as sexual minorities. Um, and so it would make sense that people wouldn't disclose that identity um, in the past. And now as sort of activism, as activists are doing incredible work to make the world slowly or try to make the world a safer place, people may feel much more empowered to come out. Um, another piece is when you're looking at the history of sort of the medical interface with trans folks, um, providers, medical providers in the past, when working with trans uh, trans individuals would often promote that people go stealth after having gender affirming surgery. So stealth um, is a cinema, synonym for what some people will say is pass uh, or blend in, basically for people to not know that you're trans, for you to sort of pass as, as a cisgender person. Now I'll say more in a, in a little bit about the word pass, but it's, it's a problematic word and, and we'll get to that later. Um, but basically there was less um, recognition and sort of promotion of, hey, you don't have to hide your identity. 
right? Um, or that's that's where sort of where we're at now. Whereas in the past, there was more of an encouragement to hide that sort of trans part of your identity. And then the internet, the internet, oh God, speaking about dialectics or thinking of dialectics, right? It's a wonderful place. It's a terrifying place. Um, but it has done a lot of good for trans and non-binary folks by providing information um, to people, providing access to language, to resources. Um, there's so much more attention being given to parents, finally, of trans and non-binary folks, of gender expansive folks. And as parents get more information and learn about how important it is to be affirming and to be supportive, parents are bringing their kids to gender clinics at a much, much higher rate. Um, and so that is, again, one of the theories. Um, okay, so that's, I hope that's helpful. A little bit about transitions, um, because people often have questions about transition. Um, there's a couple of points I wanna make. One is they're different for everybody and, and there's no one or right way to transition if you want to transition at all. And so um, when we're thinking about gender existing in more of a spectrum or that blob I showed you before, right? We think about there's so much freedom to mix and match to do what feels right for you. Um, and so I think one place that people go wrong sometimes if your kid comes out as trans and you're trying to be like an amazing advocate is you might actually inadvertently push their need to sort of pass or to do this right. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that some people, sort of some trans people will go their entire lives happily without surgery. Right? They might want hormones, but they might not want surgery, or they might want top surgery and never get bottom surgery. This is this is part of somebody's gender journey is to figure out what feels right for them across time. Um, the reason I, I referred to the term past being problematic is there's this idea that it's important to fit in or to blend in, um, to hide this amazing part of your identity. Um, and so, so I try to avoid using the word pass and instead we might talk about somebody's, somebody might have a goal of being stealth um, where basically nobody knows about their trans status um, or of blending in. Um, typically not okay to ask about people's transitions. So there's very few people who sort of would be able to ask that. Certainly if you're a parent and you're, you have a good relationship with your child, of course you can talk about goals and questions they have. Um, if people are working with providers, same thing, but we don't ever, ever ask about people's transition histories um, because we're curious. Um, so it's really, really sort of a need to know um, sort of topic. And then when we're thinking about transitions, sometimes it can be helpful to think about breaking them into a few different categories. You can think about people doing social transitions. That's where they're changing their names, their pronouns, clothing. Um, and then folks, there's a whole, wide, there's a wide ranging, um, wide range of possibilities for medical transitions, some which are fully reversible and um, some partially reversible, and then some um, very complicated to reverse. Um, and so this is information where, you know, if you are somebody who, if you're a parent looking to support a child who has questions about transitioning, certainly going to a gender clinic or a provider who has extensive knowledge on this is really helpful to understand sort of what are my options, what are the risks and benefits of, of these different processes. All right, mental health risk and protective factors. So of course, when we're, we're thinking about trans identity, we often think about gender dysphoria. Um, and so gender dysphoria is the psychological distress that comes from this incongruence that people find when between their sex assigned at birth and gender identity. Um, the identity in itself is not, is not the disorder. And I know I've said that again and again, but it's really important. So the gender dysphoria is the distress that comes from this incongruence. Um, not every trans person has gender dysphoria. So we want to be careful not to make that assumption. And you can talk about gender dysphoria sort of casually, like, oh, my gender dysphoria is high today. Or, um, you know, what I'm talking about here is really a gender dysphoria as it's sort of noted in the DSM. So for example, to meet criteria for gender dysphoria as it's listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, we're talking about, you have to have at least six month duration. You have to meet, um, you know, two of a number of criteria. Oftentimes uh, gender dysphoria will start in childhood, though that's not always the case. Um, and 
one of the things that I think is important when we're thinking about gender dysphoria is sort of how do, how do we treat it? The guidelines are to treat gender dysphoria by affirming someone's identity versus trying to treat any kind of psychopathology. Um, it can also be helpful when you're trying to understand somebody's experience and their experience with gender dysphoria to have them talk a little bit, again, if it's appropriate, to talk a little bit about the difference between an internal dysphoria or more of a social dysphoria. So it could be I'm alone in my room and I cannot stand having the chest that I have, right? I'm on an island and I'm still struggling profoundly with the way my body is looking. Um, so that's like more of an internal dysphoria versus it gives me so much distress and pain when somebody misgenders me, right? When somebody else sees me other than the way I see myself and that's more of a social dysphoria. So that can be helpful to distinguish between the two. I'm so excited to talk for a moment about the idea of gender euphoria because when we're thinking about trans and gender expansive folks, we're often talking about gender dysphoria. And more and more, especially activists, are talking about this concept of gender euphoria. So the term, I just want to be clear, it originated within the LGBTQ community. You're not going to find it in the DSM. But it's sort of the inverse of gender dysphoria, where um, it has to do, gender euphoria is described as this sort of improved subjective well-being associated with gender affirmation. So I'll have clients say to me like, oh my gosh, my gender euphoria was through the roof. Like when someone held the door open for me and was like, thank you, sir. And it's just this moment of like, yes, right? When we're thinking DBT, you might liken that to sort of building, um, accumulating positives. You might relate that to fully experiencing joy and like bringing mindfulness to that attention of gender euphoria. That's something that I certainly will do in therapy a lot is have my trans and non-binary folk patients, as well as sort of looking at and dis discussing gender dysphoria, paying a lot more attention to moments of gender euphoria and trying to build activities into their lives that increase their sense of gender euphoria. All right, so when we're thinking about mental health um, among trans and non-binary folks, I won't go through all of this data. If, if you want the slides, I can share them with you. Um, but essentially a few sort of pieces to highlight. Last time we talked about um, rates of many mental health disorders are, are really elevated for sexual minority folks. That's very much true for trans and non-binary folks and, and possibly truer, right? So um, there's a lot of research that shows um, that trans and non-binary folks have elevated levels of mental health disorders, mental health distress above and of course, above and beyond cisgender people, but even above and beyond um, LGB, LGBTQ cisgender people. And so you see elevated depression, anxiety, there's a lot of attention being given to um, autism spectrum disorders. Um, so we see that sort of the rate of trans identity, uh, the, the rate of autism spectrum disorders among folks who are trans and non-binary is not what we would expect it to be. What we expect, it's, it's much higher than we would expect it to be. And so if you are interested in this topic, John Strang is one of sort of the, the lead researchers on this. And I wanted to highlight just in case this is a particular interest for you, two papers that I recommend looking at. One, Strang et al. in 2018, um, John Strang and his colleagues did um, some more qualitative work to look at the lived experience of, uh, experiences of autistic gender diverse adolescents. So this was, um, a lot of his work lately is more community-based participatory research where he's working with um, people with lived experience and not just doing research about them, but working with them to hear their voices, to hear their ideas. Um, so if this is something you wanna understand more about, I would highly recommend going to that paper. And then the 2021 paper um, details their um, research on um, their process for developing a clinical program specifically for gender diverse. Um, autistic and neurodiverse adolescents. So it's a really, really great paper if this is something you're interested in. Um, one exciting finding, because most of this is, is sad and depressing and highlights massive disparities in mental health care or mental health uh, rates, the really exciting news we have, where is it? Right here. So um, Christy Olson is one really big researcher in the field of um, trans identity, uh, and she works a lot with trans youth. 
And she has looked, she's done a lot of research, she and her colleagues have done a lot of research looking at young trans kids um, who have socially transitioned. And what she's finding is that when kids are allowed to socially transition, so this is not any kind of medical transition, but when, for example, the parents say, okay, we'll use the name you're asking us to use. Okay, we'll use the pronouns you're asking us to use. We'll talk to your teachers about this. We'll talk to the school about it. We'll allow you to socially transition. The levels um, that these kids are reporting of depression and anxiety are no longer statistically different from the levels of their cisgender peers. So that's pretty incredible um, because we know generally trans and non-binary folks have higher levels of anxiety and depression, but some of the research is showing that doing affirmative care, performing affirmative care, and we actually have tons of research on this across time, really, really does better people's mental health rates. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to highlight. Just like we talked about last time for sexual minority youth, um, People who are non-binary, we can see sort of higher rates of mental illness in different domains, in part because of the stress and stigma of, again, not fitting in a box um, as easily, people being more confused about your identity. So, for example, um, I shared some pictures at the beginning of trans and non-binary folks, and there are some folks who, if you walked by them on the street, you might not look twice. But if somebody is non-binary and their identity looks pretty and um, not androgynous. Well, yeah, androgynous, maybe you would say, but maybe for example, they have a beard and they're wearing lipstick. That's really hard for some people to wrap their brain around. So the stigma, the harassment, the discrimination is often much higher towards non-binary folks. And so that's something of course that leads to worse mental health outcomes and um, something we wanna be really paying attention to. Unfortunately, we know suicide ideation behaviors are much higher um, in this community. One study that often gets cited um, is this study from uh, 2011, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, where they asked, uh, these were adults, trans adults, sort of about their history of suicide attempts or how many had endorsed suicide attempts in the past or in their lifetime. And when they were looking at trans folks, 41% his, um, endorsed a history of suicide attempts in their lifetime. And that was versus the, at the time, 1.6% of the general population. So you're thinking 1.6 versus 41%. There's a massive, massive problem um, as we think about uh, suicidality, suicide ideation behaviors among trans and non-binary folks. And then often we see that problem intersect with racism. And so we see here, for example, they did a breakdown by race and we see, um, of course, American and Indians who were trans um, had really elevated levels of um, suicide attempt in their, in their past. And then um, black and Latinx folks as well, multiracial folks with white um, folks who are white um, being the lowest number. I'm sorry, I'm gasping a little bit. I'm extremely pregnant. And so talking for extended periods of time is getting more difficult. Um, I should have thought about that when I booked this, this talk at this time. Um, I'm realizing, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Um, I'm going to have to move a little bit more quickly. Um, I would really encourage folks to, if you're really sort of wanting to get into this, to learn about this concept of gender minority stress. Um, this is a gender minority stress and resilience model that's been adapted across time. Basically, what this shows us is we're looking at outcomes. Let's start here. So we've got mental health outcomes and physical health outcomes. The dotted lines are inverse correlations. So the more of this you have, the more of these bad things you have, and I'll get to what they are, the worse your mental health is. Whereas these are, um, these are positive. Um, actually, sorry, let me back up. So these are distal stress factors and proximal stress factors. Distal have to do with things in the community, things outside of us. So when somebody is experiencing more discrimination, more rejection, victimization, non-affirmation of their identity, we know that that leads to worse mental and physical health outcomes. So this is where we're starting to think about risk and protection, risk and protective factors. And then what happens is there's a positive correlation between these external stressors that, that people can get exposed to 
and then internal stress factors that are unique to gender minority stress. And so these are internalized transphobia, right? Feeling a ton of shame about who you are, wishing you weren't that way, negative expectations about the future, sort of I'm never going to be affirmed, no one's ever going to love me for who I am, non-disclosure of identity, feeling like you have to hide who you are. There's a real stress associated with that. Of course, it can save your life in some scenarios, but that takes a toll. Of course, body dysphoria. And then feeling really confused about your identity, having to think and wrestle um, to sort of figure it out. Whereas again, cisgender people often have this privilege. It's just sort of like, yep, I'm cisgender and you don't spend another moment on it. But for a lot of folks struggling with their gender identity to put words to it, to express it to the world, to have people voice sort of skepticism, that can be really painful. And so the really cool piece about this, um, this chart is we see there's a number of resilient factor, resilience factors that can buffer the impact of these external and internal stress factors on outcomes. So these are important. This sort of like, how do we support trans youth? What do we know helps? Three really big categories that are incredibly important. One is community connectedness, getting people connected to role models, to LGBTQ communities, to pride parades, right, where they see other people talking about their experiences um, and thriving. And um, so fostering a sense of community, that might be joining a GSA. There's so many ways to foster a sense of community. Building pride is incredibly important work, and that's something we can do a lot in therapy. Um, this for the DBT folks out there, right? You're building opposite action to shame. That's really, really important work. And then we know um, from study after study after study at this point, how incredibly important family support is. Um, in fact, it's life-saving for, for tons and tons of trans and non-binary youth. Um, there we go. There's that opposite action to shame. Here's a list of other um, risk and protective factors. I don't think any of them are particularly surprising, um, but they're sort of important to think about, for example, when we're advocating for schools to make changes. We have a lot of research that shows that having inclusive policies, having anti-discrimination policies that specifically list gender identity, having GSAs, the research shows really, really supports well-being um, and reduces people's mental health distress. Um, one of the things that we want to be thinking about in terms of these, in terms of these sort of minority stress factors are microaggressions, which are like implicit biases that we all hold or that we might hold and then act on in some way. And sometimes they're, they come out as like well-intentioned, but it feels like a microaggression on the other end. It feels painful. It's unhelpful. It's hurtful. And so we want to just be mindful of different sort of microaggressions we might engage in across time um, that would lead to somebody experiencing more minority stress. So for example, here, you need to shave if you're trying to look like a girl. Sort of one of the problems here is somebody's having a hard time sort of accepting somebody else's sort of gender expression, right? We're trying to sort of police somebody's gender expression right here. Um, so when are you really going to transition? I don't think that one's pretty clearly problematic. Wow, I never would have known you used to be a girl. That might come out as a compliment, um, but again, really problematic. Um, this slide right here um, just highlights how many positive impacts parents and, and families and caregivers can have on um, when they support their trans and non-binary youth. I won't go through all of them, but there are so many different documented um, benefits of, of taking really supportive stance. And for all of you, as we talked about last time, who are going through this, some of you who, who do a lot of DBT or know DBT really well are probably thinking about the biosocial model, right? Where somebody might be born with emotion vulnerability. They might be just a naturally sensitive person. And then if they're trans or non-binary and they're exposed to microaggressions, they're exposed to um, tons of these external stressors like rejection, violence, discrimination, right? These two things together can make a recipe for somebody really, really struggling with their mental health, increasing their chances of having a real hard time regulating their emotions, which then can look like them, um, which then they need to figure out how to regulate, which is why, for example, we see 
even though substance abuse rates are going down across time for youth, they're going up for trans and non-binary youth, right? Because the distress is so high. It's such a clear, easy way to think about regulating your pain if you don't have access to other sort of better resources or supportive adults in your life. Um, so we want to think about how to how to really continue to support um, trans and non-binary folks. And um, one of the things we want to do is really, really pay attention to language. I'm going to go, uh, Doreen, if it's okay, like, is it okay for me to go like 10 more minutes? Absolutely. Can, yes, it is. Okay. I'm like, and, oh my God, I have so much to say. Yeah. And, and I'll just add for people out there, okay. if you're feeling like you need to leave, please remember that this is being recorded. So, you know, if you have something else that you need to get to, please feel free to, so to take so off much. and know that you will be able to come back and listen to the recording and hear the rest of the presentation later on. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so when we're talking about pronouns, they're incredibly important. And I've just crossed out this, this word preferred because language evolves. We evolve across time in our understanding of how to be um, affirming. And really, when you think about it, somebody's pronouns could be absolutely essential way to respect them and their identity. They're not preferred. They're your pronouns. I don't prefer that you use she, her pronouns with me. If you say he, when you're talking about me, I'm going to feel really confused and possibly insulted. Um, and so just for folks to know, we don't use preferred pronouns anymore. We just ask somebody, what are your pronouns? If we're talking about pronouns or, oh, their pronouns are. Um, we want to really pay attention to sort of somebody's experience of being misgendered and do whatever we can to avoid misgendering people. And part of that is using the right pronouns, catching ourselves if we use the wrong pronouns and avoid what we call dead naming people, which is using their birth name. So if they've told us a name that um, better reflects their gender identity or their new chosen name, we want to do our best to adopt that name as fast as possible. And if we make a mistake, to sort of call that out and quickly change it. Um, so that, that piece is really, really important. Um, another thing we, we can do as allies or as cisgender folks is when we introduce ourselves, share our own pronouns to normalize that it's not just the trans or non-binary person in the room who should have to share their pronouns. That's really awkward. Um, so instead, I, I will say, hi, I'm Wendy. I use she, her pronouns. And then sometimes it's up to them to share, somebody else to share whether or not they want to share their pronouns. I don't think it's helpful to require everybody to share pronouns. That's really important. And so, for example, whenever I lead groups, um, I give people the option to share their pronouns, but um, it should never be a requirement. And if somebody doesn't share pronouns, you can just ask, you can just refer to that person by their name. Um, what else do I really want to hide in terms of, uh, highlight in terms of time? Um, you might try to be a really good ally. And if you hear somebody making a mistake about somebody else's pronouns, you might correct them. What, what actually may be even more helpful because that person might not want someone correcting other people for them is to ask that person privately, like, hey, you know, I've noticed at work, like sometimes you get misgendered by, by so-and-so. Um, would you like me to step in? Would you like me to correct them? Or would you prefer I not say anything? I think that can feel really, really respectful um, to folks when you ask them for permission. Um, and you just have to practice. Sometimes it's really hard if somebody uses pronouns that you're not used to, like they, them pronouns, and that's hard for you. It takes a lot of practice and that's okay. Um, you can be patient with yourself. Um, a couple more things on pronouns. If someone, many of you might know this at this point, but if someone says, I use she, they pronouns, what that typically means is they use both. And um, they might like them both equally used. They might have a preference for the first one. You can actually ask somebody if they share this with you, oh, would you like me to use them sort of both? Do you have a preference for one over the other? Um, and of course that's different from a preferred pronoun. Um, and one thing that I notice where people go wrong is let's say sort of you look at me and I say, I use she, they pronouns, you may feel more comfortable using she pronouns. And since I've told you, you could use both, you might just only use she. I probably am not going to feel as firmed if I've told you I use she, they pronouns, if you exclusively use she pronouns. So for example, when someone tells me that I try to be really mindful about switching them up and using both, um, which can take practice. Another thing that takes practice is if somebody uses what we refer to as neo pronouns, 
So um, that can be harder to wrap your brain around. And so, for example, these right here are some, some neo pronouns that some folks use because they don't feel like these really gendered he or she pronouns are helpful. They don't sort of ascribe to the they, them pronouns. And so, for example, with using Z pronouns or Z zero pronouns, you might say Z is going to the park and will bring zero guitar. That can be really, really hard at the beginning and across time, like we can absolutely get it. Um, so it just takes, it just takes time. All right. We also want to pay attention to our gendered language. Um, there's some research that shows that some people find it actually more painful when people use really gendered language with them versus getting their pronouns wrong. And so, um, you know, if someone says like, hi, ma'am, or hi, sir, um, or my daughter or my son versus my child, right? These kinds of gendered languages, um, language options can be really, really painful for some folks. Um, and so we want to think about, you don't have to use gender pro neutral pronouns for everybody. For example, I'm a cisgender woman. I don't care if my dad refers to me as his daughter, like that fits. It's not that these are all bad terms. I think some people get that wrong. These are all not, not all bad terms, but we want to think about who we're talking about. And if we don't know how somebody identifies, it's much safer and more respectful to go with more gender neutral options. Okay, so what happens if you make a mistake? Here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to be this lady. And we've all done it. And so it's okay again, if you have. Um, but this person makes a mistake with a pronoun. She goes, oh no, oh my God, I'm so sorry. She, uh, no, he... Um, starts getting really flustered. I'm so sorry. These pronouns are really hard. I keep messing up though. I'm really trying. I promise this person inadvertently is like really making a scene. And so the trans or non-binary gender expansive person on the other end might feel like, oh, now I have to take care of this person. This is one more thing that I need to worry about today. This is one more stressor on my plate. And so as allies, when we mess up, we can, we can not do this, which is really, really great. Instead, just really simply, you might just apologize and say, apologies, they are here, right? Just apologize and correct yourself. Um, it can be very quick. It should be pretty quick. Every, every sort of instance is different, but it should be pretty quick. Um, if somebody corrects us, thank somebody for the correction. It's so reinforcing um, to have somebody thank you instead of being like, oh, right, I know, because then we feel bad for correcting them. So just thanking somebody and remember sort of like from a DBT perspective, we're all fallible. We're doing the best we can and we've got to commit to do better. All right. Um, I think it's helpful for those of you who are really versed in DBT to think about these different levels of validation and which ones can be helpful when you're sort of talking and trying to affirm trans and non-binary folks. Um, for example, a level four validation, um, validating based on someone's history. If somebody has a profound history of being discriminated and not accepted, and you as a parent say one thing that like seems supportive, but your kid has this huge reaction to and feels incredibly hurt, you might think, what the heck, that was nice of me or that was affirming of me, but you don't want to invalidate and say like, what are you talking about? Like, I was, I was good there, right? You want to say, you want to think about how does their reaction make sense? Well, actually they've been exposed to so many sort of microaggressions across time. You might say something like, sweetie, God, I actually understand how that comment could have felt really bad given how many times sort of you've experienced, you know, X, Y, Z in the past when talking about your name. And so me just bringing up your name could be really, really difficult because of the way people have talked about it in the past. Um, that's one example, but sort of thinking of levels and how to be supportive when you're thinking about um, working with trans and non-binary folks. We want to assess our own biases, of course, across time. That's really important. You can take the Harvard Implicit Association test. There's one specifically for trans folks. Um, and here there's a number of different things we can do and think about when we're when somebody does come out. Um, one that I didn't mention last time that I'll highlight here is really think if you're, if you know DBT, thinking about your primary and secondary emotions. So you may initially feel maybe horrified. You might feel angry, right? Those are probably secondary emotions fueled by judgment. You might want to stop and sort of notice like, okay, that's probably secondary. 
what's primary? Maybe you're scared. Maybe you're surprised, right? Maybe you have some sadness that you didn't notice it earlier, right? And we want to lead when we're communicating with our primary emotions and not get distracted by secondary emotions um, that can actually fuel um, sort of really negative interaction with folks in, the, in, in one of the most important moments when they're coming out. Um, all of these, all of these points are important when, when thinking about supporting people who are coming out, um, really leaning in, following people's lead, um, asking some questions if, if helpful in the right time, but respecting if somebody doesn't want to answer a lot of questions right in that moment, um, and expressing love and sort of that we will be there to support them. And then of course, taking care of yourself. This might be sort of massive, shocking news to you. Some of you might be like, I knew this from day one. Um, but for other people, it, it might be really, really surprising. And just as other folks, just as trans and non-binary folks have their own gender journey, I think it's important to remember that parents do too, right? You will have your own sort of transition um, to think about sort of how do I talk to friends about this if my child gives me permission, right? Um, there's a lot that changes for you internally that you have to think about. And I think making sure you're taking time um, to take care of yourself and, and get support for yourself. Um, and then one sort of final piece that I'll highlight is there's a lot of incredible work being done around supporting trans and non-binary folks at school. Um, so there's so many different things we can do to support, support kids in school. Um, policies are a big one. Um, having access to bathrooms of, um, of people's choice and um, really reinforcing rules around bathrooms so they're not being misused. And then um, there's a number of uh, gender spectrum, for example, is this great organization that has developed confidential gender support plans. So let's say you've got a young child who is trans or sort of exploring their gender identity. There's an entire sort of packet that you can fill out essentially to communicate with the school, to think about what are all the things I need to be thinking about? What are all the things I need to know? Um, and, and help you feel supported um, as you interface with schools and try to think about who you want to have access to what information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then of course, connecting with resources, getting as many resources as you can. I'll share, there's this um, really great um, document produced in Canada, Families in Transition, that I think is really, really helpful. Certainly Gender Spectrum is an organization I really respect. Um, Glisten, uh, tons and tons of uh, supports out there. This is brand new supporting gender expansive students. Um, it's from the Oregon um, Department of Education. It is so incredibly concept comprehensive. So if you're somebody who feels like my school needs to do better, or you're an educator and you're just sort of lost, looking at these resources for ideas, I think is a really, really wonderful, um, really wonderful sort of next step to just keep learning and to think about what are possibilities for, for ideas I can bring to my school administration. All right. Um, I apologize that took me so long. There was a lot there. Um, happy to take some questions. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being so expansive in your discussion of everything <laughs> that was on your slides. Um, Barb has just posted in the chat a reminder that the slides are available. If anybody would like to email us and request the slides, we'll be able to mail them out to you in a, in a few days time so that you can go through them in more detail because there were some really interesting references and statistics on them. Um, we do have a number of questions and I know that we're already over time. So Wendy, you let me know how much time do you want to take for slides? I want to give you a chance to sort of take a breath, breathe out a little bit because you've been speaking so much. <laughs> um, can we do like 10 minutes? Okay. All right. So we'll can take I, 10 Can I answer minutes. one? I saw one. Is it okay if I go for one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm so glad somebody brought this up because I there was so much I couldn't talk about in depth. Um, so this gold hammer paper, um, I think it was a two, 2019 citation, talks about how BPD might be overdiagnosed um, in folks who are trans and non-binary, um, who have trans and non-binary identities. And the, ar the argument is that a lot of the symptoms that look like symptoms of BPD 
might be actually better explained by sort of somebody's experience with minority stressors and having to survive. So for example, we know there's a much higher rate of sex work, right, um, among trans and non-binary folks who are trying to survive, especially folks who are homeless. And so somebody might be engaging in sex work to survive, but then that box of sort of like really risky behaviors, impulsive behaviors um, might be getting checked. We might think about identity diffusion, right? That's one of the categories for BPD, identity diffusion. And somebody without much experience in working with trans and non-binary people might say, oh, identity diffusion, right? Identity questions and check off that box. Um, when we know that the identity diffusion we're talking about in BPD is not the identity diffusion or the identity sort of exploration that, that we see for trans and non-binary people. So there's a ton of examples. Those are just two examples from that article, but um, it's a really good article if you want to sort of look at that one in more depth, and that's Goldhammer. Great, thank you. Um, it, I think a lot of the questions that have come up are around this sort of this intersection of mental health and gender identity. And, and, you know, as parents, we try to really tease out and find we want the answer, right? We want there to be one thing that we can fix that or find treatment for that. And, and um, how, so, so you, you mentioned specifically that being transgender or non-binary is not in and of itself disordered. That's, that's not a <laughs> mental health issue, times. right? Um, um, and people experience so much invalidation that it can lead them to, to all of these different mental health issues. So as we're trying to untangle this and find the best support for our loved ones, do you have any advice for us as parents in terms of how do we think about this? What are good questions to be asking um, our providers or the people who are providing treatment? What are good things to be reminding ourselves of in this sort of uh, yeah, labyrinth? I think so I think one sort of nice place is DBT providers at baseline are supposed to be non-judgmental. So I think like I, I'm attracted to the idea of DBT because it's so skills based, right? So if you're exposed to so much invalidation um, and so much pain um, sort of in the world, it makes sense to provide somebody with a ton of skills to sort of equip their tool belt to better manage all of this that comes up. So, you know, I like the idea of therapies that are evidence-based uh, like CBT and DBT to provide people with skills. Um, the other pieces I would ask people what their experience is working with trans and non-binary um, youth. You may ask them what their training is. Um, you can ask them if they take an affirmative approach. If they've never heard that word, I might like be less interested if it's something that's really important to me and it feels really sensitive. Um, you know, those are some of the sort of the um, general sort of ideas I might have. Um, also looking at the clinic, sort of like, do they have trans flags out? Do they have, do they have, like, are they focusing on DEI? Is this something that people are talking about and thinking about, or is it not? Um, you could also ask questions about borderline personality disorder and gender identity. And you, like somebody's response to that might give you an interesting, um, interesting information about sort of where they're at in, in their training. And are they, um, confusing the difference between identity diffusion and gender exploration. So there's just some, some initial ideas in terms of how to ask providers. And of course you can go on, um, different organization websites to look at people who have sort of signed up to say, Hey, I'm an LGBTQ affirming therapist, right? Like that's in my bio. I want people to know. Um, and there's a number of organizations um, where you can look people up. U um, w Path World Professional Association for Transgender mm -hmm. Health is a really, really big one. Um, do they belong to W Path? Um, so lots of ways to think about that. Right. And I, I know I'll just plug this here because I know there probably are uh, a lot of our audience from Ontario. In Ontario, there's an organization called Rainbow Health Ontario, which does... Um, affirming care for, um, they do training for medical health providers, and they maintain a list of providers who have, who have ascertained that they, that they are affirming providers. Excellent. So, um, um can I just show, yeah. share my screen for one second? Cause I yeah. see more about the gold hammer question. I'm just pulling up yeah. the article so you can all see it if you want it. 
So it's distinguishing and addressing um, gender minority stress and borderline personality disorder sym uh, symptoms. So this is the article, in case you want to read it. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Yes, I saw them popping up in the chat as yeah. well. Um, great. Okay. So um, I, I have a, a lovely question here. Well, heart-wrenching and lovely. Um, my daughter stresses a lot about not having someone to love her when she grows up. So how do I respond to that? How do I support her in that fear? Well, first of all, I think it's a really great thing that she's telling you. Um, if she uses the she pronouns, I think it's a great thing that she's telling you. That's a sort of really good first sign. Um, and you, I think you want to do whatever you can to keep the conversation going and to be really careful not to just say, of course you will, sweetie, right? That's, that's ridiculous. You're amazing. Um, that can, even though it's really well-intentioned, that might be really, really invalidating, especially with, so that kind of sort of response can be really invalidating for children who are more sensitive. Um, and so thinking about sort of our own validation skills, we might say, gosh, you know, I imagine, so this would be like a level five, um, a level five validation. It's like pretty normal actually for somebody to have that thought at this point in their development. You might say, you know, I imagine actually that's a really common worry for people who are just coming out or for people who are sort of earlier on in their gender journeys. Um, you might normalize like, yeah, that makes sense. Or, you know, I know you saw that movie last week where somebody was rejected. Like, of course, this is on your mind, right? You might, I, I would really lean in with validation, sort of how does this make sense? Um, Somebody said that's such a terrifying and painful fear to have that actually, I don't know if you meant for that to be something that you would say out loud, but you could like that. God, that's gotta be so painful to feel that way. Like, can we talk more about it? I'm glad you're talking to me. And then across time, you might say like, Hey, I, I know this is something you've been thinking about. I read these like three books um, for people who have like really grown so much as trans people who started out like with these exact same worries that you had and like, look at where they are now when you're ready, I'd love to like introduce you to them or I'd love to like give you these resources. And that's why sort of at the beginning, I said like, I want you all to go out and learn from trans role models. They are role models, right? They have been through so much and so many of them are thriving. And I think actually there's research that, that um, giving youth access to trans role models is really, really um, helpful for their mental health to see others experiencing gender euphoria, to see others celebrating gender euphoria, to celebrate trans identity. All of that can be really, really nice. And take your children to pride. Um, that mm -hmm. can be nice too. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, sorry, there are, there are you know, so many great questions here. Um, how do you respond when a service provider is essentially implying to you that some of your child's issues are related to them being transgender? How do you respond to a is service it, Yeah, like a, a service provider and they say, you've got mental health issues and those mental health issues are, are essentially arising out of them being transgender. So, so you know, we're not going to deal with this mental health issue. It's just because your kid is transgender. Yeah. So I guess if I'm really trying to hold like the DBT sort of principles in mind, instead of getting really judgmental, <laughs> um, which might be an urge that I have to do or really angry, I actually might start by trying to understand what they mean. Um, trying to get curious. Like, can you, can you say more? I'm not really sure I understand and get them to really lay it out for you. Um, because it could be that what they're saying is, yeah, they've experienced so much discrimination, like they're having panic attacks every day. Well, then that actually does make sense, right? And yes, that's because they're trans and experiencing discrimination, therefore having panic attacks. Um, so I think, you know, taking a non-defensive stance and trying to understand where somebody's coming from. And then I think as parents too, you want to advocate, right, um, for your kids and you want to find a provider who accepts your kids where they're at um, and is trying to foster well-being. And so you collaboratively with your children can always talk about changing providers if it doesn't feel like a good fit. I would just be really careful to respect your child's relationship with the provider and to see how your child is feeling and not just sort of um, unilaterally make that decision. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think 
one of the things that I'm hearing, uh, which makes sense to me, is that really you, you need to really start at that listening phase, yes. sort of so you start there with listening and having those conversations with your child or your youth and, and kind of take their lead in terms of how you how you deal with any of this, I guess. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, can I answer a different question that I've seen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead. You can, you can just moderate your own questions. <laughs> no, somebody changes their mind, right? Yeah. Um, what do you do if somebody changes their mind? I think, um, really making space for people to change their mind and not pathologizing that or saying like, I knew it was a phase or anything like that. I think, um, talking about gender as a journey is really helpful. And, um, for folks, you know, I've worked with folks who at one point identified as binary trans, and then later said, you know what, no non-binary actually makes more sense or used they pronouns. And then all of a sudden use he pronouns. What the way we usually talk about it is you're on a journey. You're trying to figure this out. We want to give you space to explore. It's exciting that you're continuing to learn more. And we want to provide sort of that psychoeducation to people that um, we're on a journey and we're trying to figure it out and that's healthy and normal. We want to give people space for that. Um, and so I think talking about it in that way and, and thinking about the past is they weren't wrong, right? If they've changed pronouns, right? Or they changed identities, it doesn't mean they were wrong. It means that they've sort of figured some new language out that actually just fits better now in time. Um, and so I think that's a really good question and a sensitive question. It's important for parents to have this language because you might feel like awkward talking to your friends, like, oh, like my child changed pronouns again today. And you're like, how do I talk about this? And your friends might be like, oh, kids these days, like they don't know, they're so confused. And it's good for you to feel equipped um, to, to have language to explain this and to not pathologize it. And there is a lot of judgment even in that, like, oh, kids are so confused these days, yeah. right? Like, like there's so there's a lot wrapped up yeah. in there, right? A lot of assumptions and a lot of judgment and a lot of blame and a lot of, um, you know, oh, well, the, the kids wouldn't be doing this if it weren't these days and it'd be okay for them to think this way. And, yeah. Okay. Um, we're we're going to be out of time. I want to ask one last question that I saw go past, which is um, in a family, if the parents are not necessarily on the same page, how mm. how do you how do you um, manage or lean into that relationship with a, with another parent who may not be so supportive? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say that's really difficult. Um, I've seen that just create so so much tension and heartbreak um, in couples before. So. Um, if you're in that situation, I'm sorry. I know it's really hard. Um, one of the things can be helpful is to sort of express your emotions or sort of lead with emotions, put judgments aside and express your emotions to your partner. Like, I'm really scared that if we don't get more information, you know, our kid isn't going to be able to talk to us. Would you mind getting more information with me versus from a professional? versus imposing your beliefs or sort of coming across as like moralistic about it um, or so intense that your partner doesn't feel safe to say, I'm confused by this or this doesn't make sense to me. And so again, like curiosity, non-judgment. And then if you're the parent who's super supportive, I think getting your own support and validation from friends, therapists on like what it's like to be on a different page from your partner because I think that's really hard and it can feel really disappointing. It can feel scary. You're like, oh my gosh, are we going to have to break up? Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, but I think trying to understand where they're coming from, there's, there's a reason that your partner might be really scared and that might be the primary emotion, but what's getting expressed might be secondary judgment, right? Um, so again, like family therapy, couples therapy, or consulting with a gender specialist, those are all ideas to help you like communicate better about it and, and patience. It might take time. Thank you. Um, I want to note that I put the link to the families and transition guide that Wendy mentioned. I put the link into the chat. It is available in the resources center at Rainbow Health Ontario. Um, and it is an excellent resource. I have it. Um, and I want to thank you again, Wendy. Is there any last comment that you would like to close out with? Uh, I think, I think there's so many questions here and I want to answer all of them. I think, um, you know, 
you can bring these questions to therapists. People are happy. Like, you know, I will here in Massachusetts, we'll just do consultations. Some of you have just a bunch of questions that have sort of piled up across time. And you can always just seek support from somebody for like a two session consultation to get your questions answered. Just want people to know, like there, there's people out there who will do that with you. You don't have to engage in like lengthy therapy, um, but there's so many questions. The other pieces I haven't spoken a lot about but there's organizations like PFLAG where you're talking to other parents going through similar stuff. And I think sort of hearing from parents and their experiences is so, so valuable. Um, just making sure that as parents and um, caregivers, you're getting the support you need. Great. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you again, Wendy, for having been with us tonight. I want to thank all of you out there in our audience. Um, thank you to Kathleen and Barb for helping with this presentation as well. I'm Doreen Heinemann, Program Manager at the Sash Bear Foundation, and you can find us at sashbear.org. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. And thanks to the folks who stayed longer. I appreciate it. Good night, everyone.